thank you so much. I'm absolutely delighted and very excited to be here. Now, before we begin, can I just tell you, did you know that this theatre, this huge historic building that we're in right now, was actually lost for 80 years. Can you believe that? 80 years, that's nearly a century. I can see some of you going, oh, but it's true. Yep, it was built by the Victorians a long, long time ago, along with the rest of Alexandra Palace. And even back then, it was the place to be. But can you imagine this place being lost and empty for all that time? Well, I reckon I might know someone who has a good idea of where lost things go. Can you guess who I'm talking about? Ah, yes, absolutely right. Some of you are calling it out. I'm sure you have all heard her name before. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, put your hands together, bring the house down for the wonderful JK Rowling. <laughs> I like you. What a response. That wow, was a, wow, wow. Very nice. <laughs> it was great, wasn't it? Oh, wow, hello, hello. JK Rowling. Now that sounds a bit formal, doesn't it? It does a bit. Can I call you Joe? I think you should. Good, good news. Um, wow, what a response. I'm still overwhelmed. We're all totally thrilled to be here today and so excited to hear about the new book. So in your own words, can you tell us the story of the Christmas pig? Well, I won't tell you the whole story because <laughs> that will spoil it a bit for you. <laughs> but this is basically the story of a young boy who loses his dearest toy, who's a little pig who has beans in his belly. And, well, to tell you the truth, his stepsister throws the pig out of the car window on a motorway. I know, it's not good, <laughs> as you can imagine. And uh, so the story really starts on Christmas Eve when this awful thing happens. And uh, to try and make it up to Jack, the hero, his stepsister buys him an identical pig. Except, of course, as you will know, if you have your own favorite toy, how can this new pig possibly be the same as the old one? So that is where the story starts. Wow, so there's a bit of a teaser there. Now, before we start chatting properly, properly, do you think we should hear a little bit from the book, guys? Yeah, yeah. I reckon so. It would be absolutely lovely and a real exclusive if we uh, met a few of the characters and started exploring this magical world that you have created. So if you would give us a little reading, that would be fab. So if, because I know you've all got books, if you would like to read along, you can turn to page 56, chapter 13. I love that sound. I used to be a teacher. You're taking me back to hearing books opening. It's very nice. So, chapter 13's title is The Night for Miracles and Lost Causes. Now, at this point in the story, Jack's beloved pig, who he calls DP, has been thrown out of the car window on a motorway and they couldn't find him. His granny and grandpa wanted to find the pig, but they couldn't find it. So Jack was furious. He trashed his bedroom. And when his stepsister gives him the new pig, which grandpa calls a Christmas pig, he tried to pull its head off and stamped on it. So. Jack then goes to bed, and his secret plan is that he will sneak out of the house when everyone's asleep and go back to the motorway. And this is what happens next. Jack knew that he must have fallen asleep because he woke in pitch darkness. People were talking in his room. He supposed Gran and Grandpa had come to see whether he was all right. He kept his eyes shut 
because he wanted them to think he was still sleeping. It's never been done, said a worried voice. I'm not sure it's possible. Of course it's possible, said a second voice. It all depends on the boy, on whether he's brave enough. He's very brave, but it's too dangerous, said a third voice, which was old and croaky. I've been there many times. I know what I'm talking about. I've been there too, said a fourth voice. Most of us have been there at one time or another. I haven't, said a fifth voice, which was slow and deep. Well, of course you haven't, said the first voice. You're too big. I'm talking about us little things. None of these people sounded familiar. Jack was starting to feel scared. Who were they? He didn't want to open his eyes in case the strangers saw that he was awake. If it's going to be done, it's got to be done tonight, said the second voice. I'm waking him up. At this, a whole chorus of voices murmured their disapproval, but Jack was more worried about the strange sensation that something was climbing up the side of his bed. He could feel it tugging at his duvet. It was small, like a kitten. He could also hear the rattling of belly beans. Then, before he could make up his mind what to do, something poked his face. Terrified, Jack slapped the poking creature away. He heard a crunching noise as it hit the wardrobe. The deep, slow voice said, ouch. And the second voice said, I've had just about enough of being hit. Jack groped for the switch on his lamp and turned it on. Blinking, he looked around his room. There was nobody there. The Christmas pig was lying at the foot of the wardrobe. Jack knew in his heart that he'd just hit the Christmas pig. Even so, he wasn't ready to see the Christmas pig get to his feet, put his trotters on his hips and say, if you hit me one more time, you horrible boy, I won't help you. Jack was so shocked and scared he couldn't move. He remembered mum once telling him that the way to find out whether you're dreaming is to pinch yourself. He tried it on his own leg. It hurt. You can talk, whispered Jack. Clever, aren't you? said the Christmas pig crossly. Jack is clever, said the croaky voice, which was coming from a battered old matchbox car that had once belonged to Jack's dad. His hood was moving up and down as he talked, and his headlights had turned into eyes. Stop being nasty to him. He's been through a lot of trouble you don't know about. I've been through trouble too, said the Christmas pig. In case you've forgotten, he tried to pull my head off. And I'm offering to help him, on certain conditions, of course. As if it wasn't strange enough to watch a cuddly pig and a toy car talking to each other, Jack now realized that lots of the other objects in the room had grown eyes and mouths just like the car. The wardrobe had big brown eyes where there'd been knots of wood and a mouth instead of a keyhole. Jack's waste paper basket had two little eyes on tin stalks, a bit like a snail's. Some of the things had even sprouted arms spindly metal ones on his bin, and floppy woolly ones on his rug. It was sort of exciting, but mostly terrifying. You've got to warn him how dangerous it will be, the matchbox car was telling the Christmas pig, otherwise he can't know what he's getting into. There was a murmur of agreement from all the things in the room. I didn't know, said Jack, finding his voice at last. I didn't know things could talk. What he really meant to say was, I didn't know you could feel. He'd been very rough with these things earlier, and none more so than the Christmas pig. We can only talk in the land of the living tonight because it's a special night, said the Christmas pig. You know what night it is, don't you? Christmas Eve, said Jack. Exactly, said the Christmas pig, and that means there's a chance, just for one night, we couldn't do it at any other time, that we can get your pig back. I know, said Jack, throwing back his duvet, which was one of the few things in the room that hadn't sprouted eyes and wasn't talking. I'm going to the motorway. That won't work, said the Christmas pig. 
DPs in the land of the lost now. If you want to save him, you'll have to go and find him there and come home together. There's no such place as the land of the lost, said Jack scornfully. You're making that up. At that, most of the things in his room began to talk at once. The box of tissues, both his slippers, and even the lampshade he'd brought to the new house from his old bedroom. It was extremely confusing and scary, and Jack didn't know whether he was more frightened of all these noisy things waking up Gran and Grandpa, who'd stop him going outside to find GP, or of the things themselves. I'll explain, croaked the matchbox car. And even though he was one of the smallest things in the room, all the other things fell silent, perhaps because he was one of the oldest. The car moved forward on his rusty wheels and spoke directly to Jack. The land of the lost is where things go when you lose them, he said. It's a strange and terrible place governed by its own peculiar laws. I've been there many times because you and your dad lost me so often. Sorry, said Jack nervously. It was true that he'd often forgotten where in, the car, where in the garden he'd last played with the little car, which was why the car was chipped and rusty. You always found me in the end, said the car, and so, thank goodness, the loser never got me. The who? said Jack. The loser, the car repeated. He rules the land of the lost. He's the reason things fall out of pockets when you thought they were secure. He's the one who befuddles your mind so you forget where you last put your pen. The loser would like to suck every single thing that belongs to humans down into his kingdom forever. He hates the living and he hates their things, which he tortures and eats. The loser's going to eat DP, whispered Jack in terror. Not as long as DP abides by the laws of the land of the lost, said the car. It's those who defy the law that the loser's allowed to catch and eat. Unfortunately, the loser makes the laws and he sometimes cheats. I've got to rescue DP, said Jack at once. How do I get to this land of the lost? You can't, or at least not alone, said the Christmas pig. You're human and it's a land of things. That's how it usually works anyway. But Christmas Eve is a night for miracles and lost causes. If you love DP enough to risk your life, then I'm ready to take you with me into the land of the lost and we'll see whether we can bring him home again. I do love him enough, said Jack at once. I love him enough for anything. All right then, said the Christmas pig. I'll help you on one condition. After we found DP and brought him home, I want you to return me to the girl who bought me. Why? asked Jack. Because I like her, said the Christmas pig. She didn't stamp on me. The old matchbox car began to say something, but the Christmas pig threw him a nasty look and the car fell silent. She won't take me back unless she knows you're happy with DP. So, do we have a deal? Deal, said Jack at once. He didn't like the Christmas pig, but knew that he needed him. You should put something on instead of pyjamas, said the Christmas pig, and take your slippers. But Jack wasn't going to be bossed around by the new pig, and in any case, it felt too weird to put his feet in things that were blinking at him. So he said, I'm comfy as I am. Now take me to the land of the lost. Wow. I don't know about you, but that's almost unfair because I just want to hear more now. How can you leave us on tenterhooks like that? That was absolutely fantastic. And don't you just love the idea? I love the idea of a land of the lost because don't you find it? Sometimes you mislay things and you're sure you put them there by the bed and they're gone. And now we know now where we know. they go to. Exactly. And and I love the idea of inanimate objects coming to life because you always think about the toys in the toy cupboard coming to life. But what about the rug and the bin with the stalks on the eyes? You know, I just, I love that. It's brilliant. So um, what inspired you to write The Christmas Pig? How did it come to you? How did the idea fly into your brain? Well, I, I, 
writers are always asked, where do you get your ideas from? And for once, because normally I don't know, normally the ideas just come and that's always hard to explain, but for once I actually know where this story came from. My son David, when he was tiny, he had a little toy pig about this big with belly beans. And it was his favorite toy and he never wanted to go to bed without it. The trouble was that David used to hide the pig and then forget where he put it. So one day, I, I, we'd spent ages trying to find the pig so David would go to sleep. And I thought, I need a replacement. One day he's gonna lose this pig and we'll never get the pig back again. So I bought a duplicate pig and hid it in a cupboard Anyway, David actually never did lose the original pig, and he found the replacement and decided it was his pig's brother. So we, we actually still own both of them. However, I got interested in what it would be like to be the replacement toy. So that's where the idea for this story came from. It, it came from the idea of, I make the hero as the replacement. He's not the chosen one. I wrote seven books about the chosen one, and now I'm writing about someone who <laughs> who wasn't really chosen, and that's what I got interested in. And I'd always wanted to write a Christmas story, and when I had the idea for the story about the pigs and the land of the lost, I thought, of course, it has to happen on Christmas Eve. So that's where it came from. <laughs> ah, and it's so lovely, actually, isn't it? That the, the replacement one is, is, is the, the hero. important one. Yep. Yeah, which yep. is kind of a really valuable life lesson. Yep. Um, so you've, you've sort of got this land of the loss where everything goes. Did part of that come to you from your own child losing toys around the house and looking well, for things? I d I'm not sure really. I, I, I had this idea of having to journey among lost things. And then I got very interested in that. And I actually created the land of the lost on a beach. And if you finish the story, you might notice there is a beach in the story. And that might have come from that beach. So we were on holiday, my family was on holiday, and I was sitting under a sunshade and I was writing, writing. My children are quite used to me doing this, so no one was annoyed. And I was, I was planning what the land of the lost would be like. So um, I, I, like, I like creating worlds. Yes. So I find that very satisfying. So I put a lot of thought into what the land of the lost would be like. And when you create these worlds, obviously they're sort of governed by their own rules and it can be quite complicated making sure that sort of everything adds up and aligns. It's like, it takes a very, very, very skilled brain to do that. How do you approach creating a whole world? Um, I, I, I don't really know. <laughs> I don't know. I just started, I started thinking, um, I suppose I created the loser who, as you've just heard, is the real baddie of the story. So he is, um, he's, he's quite evil. And I decided that um, he, would have, he would have divided his land up into different areas where different kinds of things would go. Not to say that all the scissors go together, or all the books go together. He decides how valuable the things are up above. And some things do his bidding. They're called the loss adjusters and the loss adjusters are the, are the loser's servants, and they keep his laws. So that, I just built it up bit by bit and decided what it would all look like. And yeah, I love doing that. Yeah, and it's, it's actually quite sort of scientific and mathematical almost, because you know you, each possession that you all own and we all own has a certain value, and some things you're attached to and you love, and some things you don't notice they're missing until you need it. And there's yeah. so many different worlds within the big world. Um, which of those separate worlds was it most fun to create, and do you have a favorite? Well, I, the, the, the place that I enjoyed creating most is called the City of the Mist. And I think I enjoyed that most because it's where the strangest things are. <laughs> so as Jack and the Christmas pig journey deeper and deeper into the land of the lost, things start getting a bit strange. They meet some very strange things. And I think the strangest place is probably the City of the Mist. And it's beautiful, but it's quite scary. And I quite like writing scary things, sorry. <laughs> but there are nice parts of the land of the lost as well, so don't, it, everything's fine. You don't stay in the scary places, you know. I don't, can't give it all away, but 
the City of the Mist is interesting because it's kind of got that quirky element. And I, I really love the idea that this is all set on Christmas Eve. It just seems so fitting that that's the one time of year when everything comes to life and takes takes Jack on an adventure. Um, why did you decide to set it at Christmas time? Well, I think what's interesting is I don't think you actually need to celebrate Christmas to understand um, why, it's, why I've made it that magical night because I think across cultures and religions, there are special days like Christmas where there's a feast where all of the family come together, where you exchange gifts. So what's interesting about Christmas and what's interesting about all those other special days is you're often excited about the new, but at the same time, you're enjoying celebrating old traditions. And so there's something interesting to me about the magic of that time. I'm going to get a new present, but I'll eat very, very familiar food. So it was a good way of looking at this old familiar pig that Jack loves so much, and then him being asked to love a new pig that he really doesn't love at all, as you've just heard, because he tried to pull his head off. <laughs> and that is what is so beautiful about the story, because those old traditions and the things that anchor you, the sentimentality of exactly. the pig, it's so grounding, but yet lots of people perceive Christmas as a time when you just get new things and new gifts, and so it's quite lovely the way Jack loves his old pig and doesn't ever think this new one could replace it. And you do think of Christmas as a time for traditions, but it's interesting you should say that you almost, you don't have to celebrate Christmas to love the book. And actually Christmas, I grew up in, in a sort of Bangladeshi Muslim household. And Christmas was a time when we could eat the feast and all come together. But then also we had our own traditions of having pilau rice with the Christmas turkey. I love that. <laughs> I so bet lots of you would rather have the pilau rice than the sprouts, right? <laughs> Let's, let's be honest. <laughs> and everyone has their own Christmas traditions. Um, yeah, so it is, it, there's so many special things within the book. Um, so in the reading, we obviously met Jack and he's the main character and he's such a great character. Jack, you'll come to feel like he's a friend of yours. He's got a really kind heart and he's incredibly brave. And um, there's a fabulous audiobook. Any of you that like an audiobook, especially good for long car drives and so on. And it's also out today of The Christmas Pig. And we have got a little exclusive here because I am very privileged and honoured to be able to introduce to you now the real life voice of Jack. So if you would like to put your hands together once more for Rocco Padden, the audible audiobook narrator, and also playing Jack. Hello, Rocco. You can say hi to your audience. Hello, audience. <laughs> so, hello, Joe. Hello, Connie. Hi, hi, hi. So, you play Jack in the audiobook, don't you? That's quite daunting. How did you find that? Well, um, it was great. So, at the beginning, I did feel kind of sorry for my character. He was very lonely, but as, you know, the story progressed, he started meeting new characters, and it started turning more exciting. Phew, that's what we like to hear. And we've actually got a clip that we're going to have a listen to. How, how many times have you heard this? Uh, only once this morning. <gasps> okay, it's so wonderful. Yeah, so this is, new for, this is new for all of us. New for all of us. Let's have a listen. He tried to get out again, but he'd fallen between gigantic presents with smoothly wrapped sides. Where are you? Whispered the Christmas pig. But a second later, he too had slid down the slippery golden package and landed on top of Jack. Oh no, said Jack, as they heard Toby the dog scampering towards the tree. Why did you have to rattle? <laughs> Which way to the kitchen? cried the Christmas pig, as Toby the dog's growls grew ever louder. I don't know, said Jack desperately. I'm lost! Oh, I wonder what happens next. We're being terrible teasers today always leaving you on tenterhooks. Now, Rocco, I believe you had some questions to ask Joe about the Christmas pig, so please fire away. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Joe, yes. I loved playing Jack, and I wanted to know, is this going to turn into a film, and can I be in it? 
You're really putting me on the spot here, aren't you, Rocco? I, do, I the, the truthful answer is I don't know whether it will be a film. I think it, it could make a good animation. And I definitely think we could find a place for you in that movie. Right. You have lots of weaknesses. I, I, yeah, I do, I do. So, who is your favourite character in the book? Well, apart from Jack, obviously, I should say, you've just heard me talking about him pulling off the Christmas, or trying to pull off the Christmas pig's head. As the little car said, Jack has been through some trouble before he loses his pig. So Jack, Jack's been through quite a lot, and I would describe him as a little bit lost himself. And so he's obviously one of my favorite characters, because he's the, he, along with the Christmas pig, they're the two heroes, right? And I do love the Christmas pig. But there are, there's a character called Compass, and there's a character called Pretense, and there's a character called Hope, and they, were, they are probably my three favorites other than Jack and the Pigs. Did you base any of the characters on real people? No, I only based the pigs on real pigs. <laughs> or real toy pigs, real toy pigs. <laughs> so real fake pigs. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, my favorite childhood toy was Monkey. I was horrible at naming things. So, I tried to think about him and how would I feel if he ever got lost? Did you ever have um, a special toy you had when you were growing up? I did. My, my, my equivalent of the, Chris, of the original pig was a pink teddy bear called Henry. And my grandparents bought this pink teddy bear for me when I was born. They'd only had sons, so they were excited to have a granddaughter. And I called him Henry, even though he was pink. <laughs> I had a Humphrey. Humphrey? Was, yeah, Humphrey. What kind of animal? also pink, but a koala. Oh, nice. So, yeah. nice. So Humphrey the koala. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for those questions, Rocco. And thank you guys as well, because you have also submitted some of your questions in for Joe. And I'd, I'd like to have your help if that's okay. I oh, yes, would do. Fantastic. Okay, so um, there's loads of brilliant questions in there. We're going to try and get through as many as we can. Take it away, Rocco. Right, so what was or is your favourite bedtime story? My favorite bedtime story, there is so many, but my most vivid memory of a bedtime story would be when I was very young, I think I was about five, and I had measles. And my, I remember my father reading me The Wind in the Willows, and I've always associated that book with, with actually feeling really ill. <laughs> but, but it did cheer me up because, I, yeah, I love, love the story. Good. How many drafts did you write for The Christmas Pig? I think I, I, think I did about three drafts of this story actually, which isn't that many for me, but um, it's quite, it, when I came to write it, I planned it so much, it really sort of flowed when I sat down to write it, so it's easy. What were your favorite comfort foods and drinks to have whilst writing The Christmas Pig? <laughs> um, my favorite food to eat while I'm writing is popcorn. And the, re the reason popcorn is so great to, to eat while you're writing is I'm really clumsy. And if I eat anything sticky, or, you know, soft. I'll get it on the keys or I'll spill it. So popcorn's nice and dry, so I can just shove it in and not ruin my laptop. Clever, clever. Yeah. So what life lesson or advice taken from the Christmas pig would you give to an adult? Well, I think that, I don't want, again, I don't want to do spoilers, but I think that there is a message in the book about change and which is difficult for all of us. That's not just difficult for children. I think that we've, we've all been through a period of very rapid change and we've all been living in quite a scary new world for the last 18 months. So um, yes, the story explores that. I didn't realize that I would finish the story during a pandemic, of course. I started working on this in 2012, so I had no idea that we would be in this sort of world when, I, when the book was published. Yeah, I agree. What's your favorite part of Christmas dinner? What's my favorite part of Christmas dinner? Yes. Christmas pudding, of course. <laughs> so, I mean, who doesn't love Christmas? Absolutely right. Um, I, like, I like pudding as well, but I like to have custard or ice cream just to dilute it down a bit. Anyway, enough of uh, talking about food. Moving on now. Um, what do you say to people that get writer's block? Do you get it? And how do you get inspired to get back into the zone? I, um, I have to be totally honest. I think I've only ever had writer's block once. 
which was um, when I was writing the second Harry Potter book. And I, I'm, I don't think it was true writer's block. I think I just panicked <laughs> because I hadn't expected what had happened to the first book. And I just froze and thought I've got to keep working and now I'm too scared. So, but other than that, I don't, I don't often get right. I don't really get true writer's block. Sometimes, sometimes you're having a bit of difficulty with a chapter and the best thing to do is walk away. Just walk away, just go walk the dog or something and it will sort itself out in the back of your head. Come back to it forever. Yeah. This is quite a good one. Do you say scone or scone? Scone. I agree, scone. <laughs> Did you just cheer? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's so hysterical. Are you a baker who is annoyed at people coming in and asking for it wrong? <laughs> but it is scone. It's scone, I swear. Some say scone, some say scone. You say potato, I say... Anyway, uh, time for the final question. Now, Jim Field illustrated the book. How important were the illustrations to you and did the characters in the world end up how you imagined them in your head? So this, this has been one of the most wonderful parts of um, finishing The Christmas Pig because I've never really worked with an illustrator the way that I work with Jim. Um, so this has got some very beautiful illustrations in it. And I can honestly say Jim got it right the first time, pretty much every time. I would look at these illustrations and there's one of them actually for the City of the Mist when you get there in the, in the book made me gasp when I saw it because it was exactly what I saw in my head. So he, he's just been the perfect illustrator for this book. Oh, phew, thank goodness yes. that was the answer. Because we are lucky enough to have Jim Field here with us today. So once more, please bring the roof down for Jim Field. <laughs> Everybody. Very nice to be here tonight. Nice to see real faces. Well, we were just talking about you all good, about how wonderful and beautiful the illustrators are. And I know that you're going to actually show us how to draw the Christmas pig character in just a moment. We cannot wait. But first, we'd like to know how did you find the experience of, you know, drawing the pictures, drawing the world that had come from. J.K. Rowling's head, you know, this is a daunting task, you know? Well, it, as an illustrator, it's really, it was a dream job mm. for me, um, because Joe is one of the greatest authors, storytellers yeah. in the world, and what you love as an illustrator is to sort of get into that world and the characters, and you, it's, it's really, it's quite a challenge to try and sort of understand how a comb is going to have legs and... <laughs> become a character, but I love, I love a sort of challenge like that. And um, it sounds a bit weird, but as a child, I used to kind of imagine objects and toys coming to life. And so the first time I read the story, it was something I could really connect with. And I think that really sort of helped me align with sort of Joe's vision of it, because I was like, okay, what would I want to see in a children's book? So I really sort of plunged in, as it were, into the land of the lost. And yeah, no, it was a really wonderful project to do. It's a brilliant result. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant result. Really is. Now we can all hear shuffling. You've all got your pens and paper at the ready. Uh, I believe that we too are gonna have a go at this as well. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what the results are. But uh, right now, the master will show us how the work is done. So if you could take it away, Jim. Okie dokie. There's some blank right. pages if you go to the back entitled, How to Draw the Christmas Pig. So you can have a go there. Okay, so we're gonna draw Jack's Christmas Pig. So if you have your activity book in portrait mode, what, we're gonna, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use a rent pencil first because it's very Christmassy. But with the first lines we're going to do are going to be quite light, okay? So keep it nice and sketchy and light. And then we're going to draw a bit more detailed after, okay? And that helps us get the proportion of the character and to make sure that it's going to fit in your book. Otherwise you get like a leg going off the page and it's not very good. So we're going to, let's check, am I in the frame up here? All right, there we are, there's the top and there's the bottom. All right. Okay, so in the middle of your page, your activity book, you're gonna draw lightly a circle. 
Can you all do a circle like that? Can you see it? Yes. And inside that circle, we're going to draw another circle, a smaller circle, which is where his nose is going to go eventually. Now, are we all doing? We've got the moon and the earth at the moment, haven't we? Underneath that, we're going to draw a kind of pear shape for his body. And now this wants to be about the same height as his head. So just keep it nice and light at the moment. Just get the first body parts in position. And then underneath his body, we're going to do one circle here where his foot, his right foot, is going to be. And a bit further back, a bit of a smaller foot, about here, okay, because our Christmas pig is going to be marching towards us. And then just on his body, on this side, on his left side, we're going to just sketch in lightly another circle. Now, I'm going to change pencil, but I guess you've got the same pencil, but just so it stands out a bit more. So now the real drawing begins. Are we ready? We're going to start by drawing his nose, okay? So his nose has these two bumps like this. And we join that up there. There's our little Christmas pig nose. And inside that, you're going to draw two jelly bean shapes, like so. And then you can shade them in as well if you have time. How are we all doing? We've got a nose so far, we're doing good. Okay, then above his nose, we're going to draw one circle there and one circle here, which are going to be his eyes, aren't they? And inside the circle, we're going to draw a little circle because the Christmas pig has these black plastic shiny eyes. And if we do a little circle and keep that white inside, that's going to add like a nice little highlight. You see? Can you shade that in as well? Okay, then in the middle of our nose, the Christmas pig nose, we're going to do a light vertical line upwards, just at the top where you've sketched in the circle. And then we're going to just draw in just the very top of his head. A little curved line like that. Okay. We're all keeping up, okay? Excellent. Yep. And above that line, we're going to draw his two floppy, soft ears. And it's kind of like a sort of a triangle shape here. And do the same on the other side. Like so. How are we doing? Everyone okay? Excellent. So then we're going to draw in those ears up to the back of his head. So we do a line down there and a line down there. And you can put, he's got these little white patches, you can put in another extra line in there for the extra detail. Then we're going to go back to where we drew Christmas pig's nose and we're going to draw his mouth patch, which is kind of like a big U shape like this, right? And follow that up to the other side of his nose. And in there, we can put a nice smile because he's coming alive now, isn't he? He's happy to be alive. Oh, there we are. That's nice, isn't it? And then we're going to draw in the side of his head. Now, this bit's a little bit tricky, and because we've done that circle before, that can really help us to try and guide our line where to go, okay? So the line you've drawn next to the top right ear, you're going to come down a little bit, then you're going to come out for his cheeks like this, okay? And try and use that line you did first of all, that circle line, to follow. Like that. Now this bit is, it is tricky. Then you've got to try and do the same on the other side. Okay, so we join up to his mouth shape there. Okay, has everyone got a Christmas pig head? Yeah. yeah? Excellent. 
Okay, well now he needs a body, doesn't he? Right, so we start on this side, and we're going to do a line down, like that sort of pear shape I was saying before. And where we sketched in that little circle for his left hand, leave that bit empty for now. We're going to come back and put his hand in there in a bit. So we've got this kind of pear shape here. Then we're going to draw in the patch for his belly, okay? So the patch is really a sort of pear shape inside there. Okay. And then we're going to do his right arm. Now, because he's walking, his right foot is forward, so his right arm is going to be back. So we're going to do his shoulder starting up by his head and tuck it alongside his body like that. That bit's quite easy, that one. And then you can put a little line for where his cute little trotter is. And then on this side, we're going to draw in his left hand. It's kind of like a sort of E shape, like so. And we can fill in that little patch there, and then put a curved line there, and you can shade that into. And then we're going to draw the line down from his shoulder like so. So now he's missing a couple of legs, isn't he? So this right foot is marching towards us, okay? So we're going to do that same trotter shape, but as if it's sort of upwards, raise off the ground. And then you can put a, another line for where his trotter patches there. We're nearly there. Then we're going to draw, go back to the underneath his body. I'm going to draw a line down and join it up to that foot. And the same on the other side. Everybody got a one-legged Christmas pig? Yep. Good stuff. Then his left leg is kind of behind him. So you've got a little curve down like that. And this foot's going to be flat because it's squashed on the floor, isn't it? Because it's a nice squishy plush toy. And you can put in a couple of little creases there. Then the last thing that makes your drawing look really professional is if you put a little shadow under each of his feet, that's how you become a real artist. <laughs> Especially if you sign your name next to it as well. There we are. And there you have the finished Christmas pig. How did you get on Rocco? Uh, well, um, so I didn't really have a rubber on mine. Oh, that's no rubber. Yeah, mine looks a little bit wonky. That is great. I don't know how well you can see that. That's pretty good. Okay, okay. Pretty good. I'm not sure how easy. It, how did you get on Joe? Oh, wow, oh, that that's great. pretty spectacular. Look at that. Jim, Jim will be illustrating her own books very soon. <laughs> awesome. There we go. And mine's only got one leg at the moment, but all that will be rectified shortly. I'm a bit, that was bit slow. That was so I fantastic. Just on one of the arms. You just scribbled on one of the arms. Yeah, okay. right. I did a lot of rubbing out. Can't fit it in. It's it? really, I'm very, very impressed. Very high standard and lots of good ones out there from what I could see. Um, you know what? This is time to say, oh, it's nearly time for us to say goodbye. Oh, I know, I know. But I have one last question for everyone on the stage right now. And this is quite a biggie. So think, think hard. We'll kick off with you, Jim. <gasps> Don't look so scared. <laughs> it's going to be fine. Uh, what would you like for Christmas this year? Oh, well, actually, it's quite an emotional one because my wife and I moved house this summer. So just to have the family together in our house will be amazing because last year oh. we didn't really have a Christmas.
exactly. That's the way it should be. No <laughs> consumer goods will make you happy. Fun. Your family, yeah. good heart-to-heart -heart connections. Fun. Family. Are you saying the same thing? You have to pick a new answer. Yeah, of course. I mean. <laughs> so I am quite the tennis player. So what I'm hoping Ooh. for this Christmas is a brand new tennis racket. Oh, brand new tennis racket. That's good. Sport is healthy. <laughs> see some people nodding away in the front also maybe wanting some sporting goods for Christmas so Joe oh, yes what would you like for Christmas well this year? um Jim has slightly stolen my answer because I think we'd all like a better Christmas this year wouldn't we so I would love to have all of my family together but I think it's just to vary things a bit it would be nice if Covid disappeared don't you think yeah so yes yes, yes. That would be nice. So let's let's hope for that. Yeah, fingers crossed. I, fingers crossed. I feel like all of these could be done deals. I'm feeling a positive, and you will too when you read the book. It is so fantastic. Um, all that remains really is for me to thank all of you uh, tonight, including yourselves. Thank you so much thank for being a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful audience. You can give yourselves a round of applause. I'm sure you all agree. We cannot wait to read The Christmas Pig. I've read it already, and as I said, it is absolutely fantastic. So all that remains now is for you all to join with me and give the most massive round of applause ever to... Uh, wait, wait, wait. Let me tell you who to, and then we can go wild and bring the house down and stomp and everything to our fantastic Audible narrator, Rocco Padden. Extraordinaire, who did a brilliant draw along, Jim Phil. <laughs> and of course, last but definitely not least, the most amazing, formidable author that lives on our planet today, arguably, JK Rowling. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.